Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, I know that many of us have been here since 8 a.m., um, so thank you for sticking out for the last and, in my opinion, the best session. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm an um, education policy and management master's student at the education school. Um, I've had the privilege of working with this amazing group of educators and leaders in education for this panel. Um, I could say a lot of things about them, but I will let them, them speak for themselves. Um, and I know that this day has been very heavy for some topics. I just want to acknowledge that for folks who have been here throughout the day, hearing about all the various facets of poverty and inequality is a lot. Um, but I'm hoping that education, one of the reasons why I'm in education is because there is so much hope and potential in this system, as well as inequality that we'll learn about today. But just wanted to acknowledge that. Without further ado, um, finish up your polling, and I'm going to turn it over to Laura Moore, who is the Policy Associate at Opportunity Insights, which is an institute here at Harvard that does fabulous work, and we'll take it from there. So, Ms. Laura. Thanks so much, Sarah, um, and thank you to all of you for sticking it out um, and staying in this last session. We, um, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Laura Moore, I'm a Policy Associate at Opportunity Insights. It's a research and policy institute based um, at Harvard in the Economics Department, and our mission as an organization is to develop scalable policies that will help empower families to move out of poverty. Um, my background is in education. Um, so for the last 10 years, I've worked at the national, state, and local level, most recently coming from Nashville, um, in education policy and advocacy and research. And so incredibly excited to be with our panelists and with all of you who um, we just turned away from our poll, but it looks like you guys represent a lot of really important facets of education. So excited for the conversation today. Um, we have um, several objectives for our time together in our session. Um, the first is that we'll focus on policy issues that maintain poverty and inequitable schools with a focus on race and socioeconomic um, and geographic inequities. We'll hear perspectives of those involved in policy, reform efforts, practice, and family engagement. Um, and lastly, um, our hope is to really give you all as attendees sort of tools, strategies, and frameworks that you can apply directly in your daily work. Um, and we also want this to be an interactive session, so you'll notice throughout, we'll have you guys talking to each other, we'll ask you to give us feedback. We've tried to mix in some multimedia, so um, we also hope that it's a fun time together as well. Um, before we get started, um, well I guess one thing, make sure to stay logged into the poll, there will be another question later on. Um, but first, before we get started, I would love for us to do a quick land acknowledgement, and so I will turn it over to Eric. So hi everybody, my name is Eric Becerra, I'm a student at the Harvard Grad School of Education. Um, basically before we get started in sharing ideas, it's uh, the indigenous tradition, a lot of cultures, including my own, that the Quechua culture to ask permission uh, of the peoples who originally inhabited the land to share those ideas. So I'd like to make a land acknowledgement to Wampanoag people and the other indigenous tribes that were displaced um, from this area so that we could have this space to share today. Um, so to get us started, we're going to do introductions, um, but I've sort of asked all of our panelists to do it in kind of a different way. So um, in addition to just saying who they are and where they work, they're going to share an image or a fact with you all that illustrates their perspective um, and how they kind of look at this work of inequality. Um, I will start with a few slides that kind of illustrate my own perspective. Um, I cheated, I have three images, um, but I'm taking that liberties as the moderator. Um, and so the next three slides I'll show you are kind of visualizations of our research at Opportunity Insights. So we heard from our keynote about this idea of the American dream and sort of heard that there's many different ways to conceptualize it. Um, since we're um, based in an economics department, one of the ways that we think about this um, is this idea that if you work hard, um, that your children will have the opportunity to grow up and earn more than you when they become adults. Um, and so we see that for individuals who were born in the 1940s, that idea of the American dream was a virtual guarantee. About 92% of folks who were born in the 40s grew up to earn more than their parents in adulthood. Um, but you see that there's this declining um, kind of state of the American dream so that for folks born in the 80s, folks that are our age, it's virtually a coin flip. So there's a 50-50 chance that folks in our generation will 
I guess we're all grown up now, but that we'll make more than our parents did. Um, and so that really drives a lot of our work um, at Opportunity Insights, is how do we reverse that trend? Another way that we look at this is not just how has that overall trend changed over the last half century, but how does it vary when we look across our communities and in, in this country? Um, and so what you're seeing is a visualization of the outcomes of about 20 million Americans born between 1978 and 1983. Um, and what we have done is we have assigned individuals to the communities that they grew up in to identify the impact of place on long-term outcomes of individuals. Um, and so for this slide, one thing that's important to note is that this is looking at individuals born in low-income families. And so all of these children are starting at the same starting point but you can see that where they end up in adulthood varies widely across the country. So if you're in a place like Charlotte and you're born in a low-income family, on average you'll grow up to earn about $26,000. But if you're from a place like Dubuque, Iowa, that same low-income child will grow up to make about $46,000. So tremendous variation in that overall decline that I shared a moment ago. And then the last thing that is really important to us is really thinking about not only how does that vary by place, but how it varies by race. And so I've got two images here that look at the outcomes of black men growing up in low-income families on the left compared to low-income white men on the right. And one thing that we like to highlight is that these two maps are on the same scale. Um, and I think oftentimes we think about places as being monolithically good or bad for all kids, um, but there's even variation when we look within places and sort of break that out in a racial way. So that overall 26,000 figure we saw for Charlotte, when you break it down this way, it's about $21,000 for low-income black men compared to $35,000 in adulthood for low-income white men. Um, so for us, when we're thinking about how do we revive the American dream, um, we know that we have to have this, um, not only a socioeconomic lens, but a race lens as well. Um, so I thought that was important for you all to understand my perspective in this work. I mentioned that before I came to this economics-focused group and my background has been in education. And so one thing that um, I have seen over the last 10 years is that a lot of the problems of our society show up in schools and people assume that all of the solutions must also emanate from within the school walls. Um, and so I think that's obviously tough and sort of changes the way that we think about education and what supports are inside and outside of school, what partnerships we have, um, but I will stop there. Um, so I'd love for our panelists to now introduce themselves. Um, just give a brief introduction, um, share your name and title, and then discuss your image or visual, and tell us about why it's important and impactful to your work. And I'll start with Dr. Irvin Scott. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, I need to hear you better than that. Let's try that one more time. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Beautiful, beautiful. So I'm delighted to be here. I'm a part of the Harvard Graduate School of Education, part of the faculty over there. Um, and if you were to ask me 35 years ago, I was about uh, 15 years old. I was in ninth grade. If you were to ask me um, what I thought I'd be then, it wouldn't be a Harvard pr professor. It wouldn't be, I would be talking to students at Harvard Kennedy School. Um, it probably would have been um, that I will be the next Tony Dorsett running back for the Dallas Cowboys, <laughs> number 33. Um, but I've had, I, I've been blessed with three things that I think in many ways have um, propelled me forward. Two of them lit the fire. The third one accelerated the, the flame. The first one was family, my parents. And the second one was faith, my faith, um, and my family's faith. The third one was the classroom, right? Powerful teaching and learning experiences. Um, amazing, amazing teachers, both the elementary, middle, and high school level, ultimately in college. And in many ways, I've spent my career as a teacher, 15 years, high school English teacher, loved it with a passion, choir director, high school principal, assistant superintendent for high schools in Boston, chief academic officer in Boston, and then deputy director of Bill and Linda Gates Foundation overseeing their teacher work. 
I spent my career trying to shape this, but try, trying really to shape it for students who looked a lot like me, right? And so I think so much of what this conversation should be about should be about this classroom, right? Um, I think it goes beyond, obviously, in the classroom, obviously, the classroom, but with 3.3 million teachers in this country um, and leaders who need to be supported and need to have powerful curriculum, um, I think this is a critical conversation for closing the gap around poverty, and I'm delighted to join you with you. It's a lot. Uh, my name's Charlie Barone. I am uh, Chief Policy Officer for Democrats for Education Reform and for Education Reform Now. Uh, I got into uh, my professional life as a clinical psychologist. I worked uh, directly with children and families in clinical settings, uh, doing everything from you know assessment batteries to one-on-one uh, -on -one therapy family therapy, uh, play therapy with children in after school and in the summer, uh, mainly uh, young children who are identified with things like ADHD or conduct disorder, uh, some other things, autism, uh, developmental disabilities and things like that. And uh, I was an academic as well, I was on an academic track and then sort of on a whim, went to Washington to DC to be a congressional staffer. And then I kind of didn't look back for a while. So I did that for about 10 years. And so what's always interesting to me is the relationship between you know, what we know from research and how do you bring that, so we were talking a little bit about uh, some of the work that Laura does, how do you bring that to, to a community and have folks translate it into policy? So uh, <coughs> this is a, a chart from, uh, oh, I'm supposed to change the slide. <laughs> So this is a chart from a study that uh, was done by Education Reform Now, not me, uh, our DC chapter, so I don't take credit for the work. But this is a graph of schools in DC with the y-axis being student achievement growth and the x-axis being school poverty level. So this tells you know at least three different stories, right? One story is we do see a line. Right? So this is not surprising that it's the schools with lower concentrations of poverty where we see the most student growth. So that's not really news. Um, but if poverty were destiny, we would see all these schools up here around the same achievement level, and that's not what we see. What we see is a lot of scatter. Uh, even with schools that are 80% poverty in terms of student growth. So we have one school up here that's you know, close to 90% poverty and has growth you know, that's higher than most of the schools that are below it. So again, there's a line you can draw here and the highest achieving schools are still the ones with the lowest poverty rate. But schools can make a difference. And what we do in schools can make a real difference for low-income kids and other kids who come from, uh, you know, backgrounds that put them at risk. And then, you know, Laura posed the right question at the beginning, how much do you expect the school to do? Well, we have a lot of work to do, right? So some of it we can do in schools, and we can get somewhere. And some of it probably are things that are, you know, what are called intersectional. And some of the schools we studied, uh, my colleagues studied, that are high achieving did emphasize wraparound and coordinating services from outside the school around healthcare, referrals to mental health and those kinds of things. So the school can be a hub for some of those things, but we need to think about how we have the school doing its piece and figure out what else we need to do to close these gaps. But we're making some progress. So good morning, uh, good morning, good afternoon everybody. My name is Eric Becerra. Um, I'm, like I mentioned earlier, I'm a current EDLD student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, originally from Mexico, Jalisco. 
um, and grew up in Salinas, California, migrant farm working uh, town in Central California. So this image that we have up here is, uh, you know, farm workers picking artichoke. Um, Castro is known as the artichoke center of, of the world, so most of the people who live there grew up in a family where the parents worked in these fields, including myself. Um, my father to this day still works uh, at, as a farm worker. Um, and I put that quote up because uh, we don't see our parents much, right? Because they, they go to work before the sun rises and they come back after the sun sets. Um, a lot of educators interpret that as our parents don't care because they're not at the meetings, they're not at the PTO, they're not at the back to school night. Um, they don't have time or the knowledge to help us with our homework. Uh, my father immigrated here at 17, possessing a second grade education. So by the time I was in third grade, no one to help with homework, right? Um, so I put this up there just to frame um, what reality looks like for a lot of our students um, in these communities. I had the great privilege and, and uh, to, to meet and encounter a, a school counselor who really motivated me to go to college um, and showed me the way, but I was one of those few fortunate ones, right? We saw some of the statistics. Um, it was mentioned earlier that we can't separate race from uh, the economy, and that really is the case in, in our community. When you look at the lines, um, where the poverty line is, everybody who's below the poverty line looks like me. Um, the students who go to college don't look like me, right? So um, being raised in a community like that, education is really positioned as the one lever to change that and to break the chain of generational poverty that has existed. It's not the only lever, um, but it's the one that was positioned in my life. Um, so that's why I've devoted my, my career to help and empower and, and uh, help other youth um, achieve that dream as, as well. So this picture you see here is, is my son. Those boots he's wearing are my father's. Um, so for me, it's because of those boots. They don't look like much, right? They're not like uh, fancy, but they're, they're worth more than any pair of shoes to me. Because, be, because of those boots, the man who wore them, I was able to be a first generation college student and college graduate. I also had the opportunity to work in the field myself at age 14. Not something I want for, for anybody to have to do as a career for a whole life. And because of those boots and the man who wore them, my son will never have to wear them again after taking this picture. Good afternoon, everyone um, in the audience and our guests joining us via live stream. I am Tahita Baker Jones. I am also a first year doctoral student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, and prior to that, I was the president and CEO of Advocates for Diversity in Our Schools and a superintendent of a charter district in New Jersey. Um, the image that you see um, for me is actually my great great grandfather, Lodrick Harris Sr my great-great-grandmother, Pearl Dixon Harris, my great-grandfather, Lodrick Jr., his sister, Lucille, and his sister, Marguerite. Um, this photo is the only photo that we have left of my great-great-grandmother, Pearl, and that is because on March 10th, 1935, um, in um, Marion, West Virginia, the um, Ku Klux Klan came and burned down their home. Um, my great-great-grandfather was a business owner in Marion, West Virginia, and he was very active in the NAACP and other civil rights organizations in the community. Um, and because of that, he rustled a lot of feathers with the white establishment at the time. Um, and they came to their home that evening and burned it, thinking that the entire family was there. However, it was just my great-great-grandmother and my um, then great grandfather, his sister Marguerite the baby, and his younger brother Ulysses, who isn't featured in the photo yet. Um, and my grandmother Pearl wasn't able to escape, but my great grandfather was, and he at that time was 16, and he took his younger siblings through the woods to their older sister Lucille's house, who was 20 and married at the time. Um, when their father got wind of what was going on, he came to Lucille's house and picked up the children, who Marguerite at the time was six and Ulysses was four, and they fled to Ohio through the woods in the night grieving for my grandmother and the mother. Um, and before they left, Lucille gave my great-grandfather this photo of their mom so that he can remember her, and they never saw Lucille and her husband again. And so this picture reminds me of the work that my ancestors have done to get me to this point and how lives were lost in my own family so that I can have the privilege and the honor to even sit here today. Um, but one other thing that it reminds me of is that my great grandmother Lucille, I mean Pearl, I'm sorry, she um, was an educator in West, West um, Virginia and she was also the niece of one of the first African-Americans to pursue graduate studies at Columbia University. 
Um, and so education runs deep in my family. Um, he later became a professor at Valley State College in Georgia. And it's always been centered around civil rights. And I really believe that education is the great equalizer. I've seen it in my own family. Um, our family having to uproot from West Virginia, go to Ohio with nothing and start from scratch. And so when we talk about poverty and we talk about generational poverty, sometimes we leave those narratives out of how African Americans have had to pick up and restart generation after generation after generation just to try to make a living and try to achieve the American dream. Or when we talk about migrant families picking up from their roots in Mexico and relocating to another country, starting over to achieve that American dream. And so education is the way that many of us achieve that. And so what can we do as a collective of educators who have the privilege to sit under trees and enjoy the shade that we did not plant? Um, how can we uh, use that lever to level the playing field? And so that inspires me every day. Um, my grandfather gave me this picture a few years ago. He was the custodian of records for our family and he gave me all of the documents to continue that tradition. So I keep this and hold this dear and it centers me and my work. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Akbar Cook. I am currently the principal of Westside High School in North New Jersey. I get a couple names on social media. I'm either the Ellen guy or the laundromat man. So whichever one you want to call me. Um, I want to say this this picture, I want before we even get to the picture, um, my grandmother always was a caregiver to the community and she um she um took on students or, or, or children that were less fortunate and, and not even not always the good ones. She took some of the I don't want to say the bad word, but like crack babies, right? The families that were uh, doing real bad. And she took them in and she gave them so much love. And that love just be ingrained in our DNA because they're our cousins now. Like we still have them in our family. We take care of them. So I want to look at, you know, looking at the children holistically as a family business for me. My grandmother started it with us and then I had two aunts that was in education. So when I was playing, playing sports, I always knew that I could always go back to education. So I started working at a camp, I wanna say around 14 and 15, and then there was, I realized that I can lead a group of young folks to the, to the right way. And uh, after I went to college, I, I knew that I could come home and, and go into education. But when I came home, uh, everyone looked at me like this, this big black man, and they wanted me to be this drill sergeant to these children. And it took me a while to find my way because I wasn't that person. I always led with love, and it was hard to try to break down that, you know, that stigma of I'm this big guy that can just move mountains and stuff like that. So it took me a while, I want to say about four or five years for me to find my way. But once I found my groove, I just, I just, I just, I just was doing me, as the kids would say. And I just would, I would just lead with love. And, and I, I got my master's around 2006. I came home in 2000. I got my master's around 2006. And I just sat, I just sat for a while. I just wanted to know that I can go back to school and get the master's. I just was happy with that, almost complacent. And one of my aunts, she just kept saying, I, like, you can do more work. I see the manager becoming. Uh, it's great to be, you know, in front of a class with 25 or 90, but imagine impact if you can do the whole building, 600, 700 to 1,000. And I, I just I just stalled. I just kept, you know, just being a good teacher. And uh, my aunt ended up passing. She, she died from, uh, she had stage four cancer. And it kind of drove home the fact that I didn't go as hard as I wanted to, and she didn't get to see it. So I want to say not even a month later after she passed away, I got a job as an uh, administrator, as a vice principal in Newark. And I want to say that was about 2012. And ever since then, I've just been trying to do everything I can possibly do to make sure that these kids have a fighting chance. And what you see with this picture, I mean, I want to say it's almost, uh, this was August. I had just got the job as a principal. And one of the things that was, that was in my building that, that folks, uh, I guess we all see it now, but, but the kids weren't being taken care of. Eric talked about sometimes the parents do work and they're not there, but I was having parents that wanted nothing to do with the children. They would just send them to school any old way and, and uh, Child Protective Services, they're usually, you know, they're there for the middle school and elementary kids, but it's little high school babies that they forget about. That same parent will send little Johnny to school, you know, looking very nice and not disheveled, but Billy that's in high school will come smelling some type of way and, they, and then they find it out, oh, now he's not coming to school or he's being bullied. And, 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 I, and I just, I sat with these folks right here at the table 
And I just was telling them this story as I'm telling to you. And uh, the young lady in the middle uh, with the gray hair, Ellen Lambert, she, um, she's the head of a local uh, energy company in my area, PSENG. And um, I said, wouldn't it be amazing if I could just get some washes and dryers and just put in my building and all those babies that are staying home because they don't have clean clothes, we can just let them come in and wash. And she said, you know what? I'm gonna get you those washes and dryers. She said, I'm gonna give you a $20,000 grant to do it. And she said, you just gotta write the grant. And when I say I wrote the worst grant in history, <laughs> it said <laughs> something like, we need washes and dryers, please help. <laughs> And uh, somehow, somehow she pushed it through, and and I put this picture up not just because of Washington Drive because it almost took a year. It almost took a year for it to happen. When you start dealing with the politics of a uh, board of education and how money moves throughout, the, and the kids get lost. So while this was going on, I still were having I still were having was having kids not come to school, and it took this one incident. I know I might be so you might have heard it. This one young lady she came in. And she was beautiful, y'all. She had like, the makeup on, her eyebrows were slayed, as the ladies say, right? Nice. And you wouldn't think nothing was wrong. And my security guards checked her, and while they was checking her, she took a bottle of water, threw it at the security guard face. Big old scuffle ensued, and we ended up having a detainer. When the police came, they pulled me to the side and said, Cook, this young lady was fighting like that because she was fighting for a prize. She had dirty underwear and dirty clothes in the bag, and she was homeless, and she didn't want anyone to know. So here I am looking at her out exterior, not looking at the whole child, looking at her holistically. And I was one of the culprits doing the same thing. So from then on, I fought and I fought. And this was the day that we cut the ribbons and opened up, I want to say the first laundromat open to the, uh, the community and the school, I want to say in the world. And uh, it's just been a, a whirlwind <laughs> roller coaster ever since the Ellen episode and some, uh, uh, some other things in the CNN article. And um, I want to say I have more laundry detergent than most Walmarts. It is, it is crazy, but I'm just so happy that the word is getting out that we're looking at different ways to look at the student holistically and not just be, uh, you know, we spending our money on SAT prep. If the kid is disheveled and smelling, they don't, they're not going to sit down for any test that you have in front of them. So I want to just, you know, create the environment where they're fighting for the education while I'm fighting for them and the things they can't control. So. This what this picture symbolizes, all the love right here that uh, help uh, my babies get the necessary needs to be successful. Thank you. Your perspectives with the group. Um, Principal Cook, you got us kind of started, um, but would love to kind of ask the rest of our panelists, what are the intersections that you see between race and poverty in your work? And what are the challenges you faced, but also what are some of the successes you faced in addressing them? I'm gonna pass it to you. <laughs> um, let's see, well, um, lately I've actually been really um, somewhat pleased with how much people feel are feeling comfortable talking about race, right? That's been my sense across the country. Um, but one of my concerns is that we often talk about it without um, like specifically looking at data around what we're going to do about it, right? So there's one thing to talk about it, and people are getting more comfortable talking about it. But the question for me is, what do we actually do about it? And so one of the things that I've been really focused on in, I think, uh, each area of my um, professional career, teacher, principal, district leader at the Bill, and at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is looking at data that actually um, could potentially move by systems and structures that I put in place. For example, um, when I became the assistant superintendent for uh, high schools in Boston, um, Boston high schools didn't have AP courses in all of the high schools. Um, and to me, that was that's just a sacrilege. I think AP advanced placement courses should be offered for all students, and we have the responsibility as educators to make sure that they have access to those courses and they have the support to actually do well in them. Um, and so, one of the things we did, the superintendent and I, she gave me permission to do this, is just to mandate that all high schools in Boston would have uh, advanced placement courses offered. 
Um, and then we had the responsibility of making sure that we were supporting teachers to ensure that uh, they are being taught well and students can be successful in them. So it's not just mandating, but it's supporting people to be successful in them. Um, at the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation, we were really focused on uh, uh, teacher uh, evaluation, teacher professional development, teacher support. Um, what we oftentimes find is, particularly in schools where there are marginalized students, the students who need great teachers the most oftentimes end up with the most struggling teachers. I don't understand why, why we would do that, and so uh, one of the things that we try to do at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is first, have a system where we can identify how teachers are doing, right? We, we really didn't know how teachers were doing across the board. Parents have a sense, students have a sense, but we didn't really have a way of tracking that. So how do we have robust evaluation systems that allow us to understand how teachers are performing? And then how do we make sure that we have the strength, the courage to say, we're gonna make sure the students who need strong teaching the most have the strongest teachers rather than the newest teachers rather than the teachers who are struggling. So I, I give those examples because it's, it's to me, this, this conversation has to go beyond just let's get comfortable talking about the role of race in poverty. And let's actually begin looking at strategies and data that actually will move uh, things for individual kids. So that's what I would say. Uh, so much you could talk about here, particularly as the token white guy on the panel. So, um, which is great. Um, I mean, th there's so many levels to this. You know, obviously, resource inequity is just one huge problem um, that affects kids uh, from low-income families and kids of color. Just everything is rigged. You know, um, the assignment of teachers, the way that uh, Dr. Scott talked about, and so, um, yeah, I'm for using policy and data to figure things out, and I guess for people who are gonna advocate, I think you do wanna try to figure out wherever it is that you want to have an impact, what's going on in that place um, where you can fit in what you think is a good policy for kids? What's the policy landscape? What's the political landscape? What kind of ideas can you bring? And try, I think we're moving, in education we just went through like a decade or 15 years of like cookie cutter solutions to education problems and some of those got us to a certain way but I think what should be next is that we use data and we craft policies that are you know, fitted to need. So if you are in Boston and you realize, well, there's a lot of schools that don't offer AP, and AP is really important in terms of getting into to college and you might get some credits, let's do AP classes. If we're seeing that children of color and children from low-income families uh, tend to be assigned um, the teachers with the least experience, the teachers with the least subject matter knowledge, uh, teachers that don't have a specialization in things like ELL or disability, why is that? Why, uh, for collective bargaining, but why in the field of education does every salary system pretty much for teachers center around seniority and maybe a master's degree and nothing else? Why don't we have differential pay in education the way we do even in other union represented fields? You know, if you're a union electrician and you're willing to go 50 stories up and hang on an I-beam, you get a little extra for doing that, you know? And so, and here's the other thing I'd say, just, you know, I know we're on tape here to be candid. It's tough politically because people of privilege first and foremost, care about their own kids. So that when you're advocating for kids uh, who don't have the same advantages, the first reaction from them might be, oh, that's gonna take attention and resources away from my school. And even white affluent progressives who will tell you that they're very, you know, non-prejudiced and the whole script you hear, right, along those lines, there's other things going on. I mean, they, they still have stereotypes. Uh, and you see those come out in many different ways. So those are just things you have to be attuned to because they're real dynamics 
So we had like three hours we could talk about like different ways we've seen that play out in different places. But that's a real dynamic that you have to contend with, both in how you message what you do. I'm not saying you don't take it on, but you have to think strategically about how you're gonna take it on. And then what what's a creative way where you can get around that? Not, I'm gonna take money from this school district and give it to that school district. If you can do that, great. It's very hard to do on most of the work. But can I find a more creative way that sounds, that has a political course that would do essentially the same thing? Um, I think in my role in two in two areas one at the systems level and I'll start there first and then at the um, looking at more the federal level and policy I think that the challenge is sometimes when we design policy we don't design policy we design well-meaning policies but we don't think about all the layers that go with that right um, and so they're well-intentioned but they don't always secure the expected outcomes um, and an example of that in my own um, background is when I became the superintendent of the charter district um, in New Jersey. And that first year that um, the school opened, the board passed the uniform policy, which on the surface seemed really good because we're like, we don't want kids worried about who's wearing the latest you know, fashion and footwear. And we want them to just be focused on school and academics. So a very well-intentioned policy um, with a well-intentioned purpose behind it. However, about maybe six months into the school year, I started getting the discipline data and I started to see large numbers of students being in detention or being suspended because of the uniform policy uh, for various infractions, of, of mostly of not wearing the appropriate footwear um, and not having the blazer, which was required as part of the uniform code. Um, and so I met with the Dean of Students to like figure out like what's happening here? Why are so many students um, being suspended and having detention for the uniform? Um, and he decided to do a little bit more work and uh, what he came back with was that the family stated that they one couldn't afford the um, shoes uh, that the school was asking the students to purchase and that we were asking them to wear black dress shoes and families couldn't afford them and they couldn't afford the blazer which was $80. Um, and so I, you know, my first thing was like to, like, I caught myself, I was like, they can't afford the shoes. And so I went to several stores. I went to Target and I went to Payless to see like, well, how much are these shoes? Because I noticed mostly young men were being suspended. Um, and the cheapest shoes I could find was $35, which for a family on a fixed income or look, that could be a lot of money. Um, and so I was trying to figure out, like, what can we do about this? Like, short of, like, getting rid of the uniform policy and staying true to implementing it with fidelity, um, you know, how can we address this? So um, I ended up reaching out to a different, uh, talking to the woman at the Payless Shoe Store. We were talking, I was like, I can't believe the shoes are so expensive. <laughs> and so she mentioned that the um, corporate office had a program called the, um, it was the uh, shopping cart program. And she was like, you should reach out to them about that. And I did, and we, it ended up formulating a five-year partnership with Payless Shoes where we could issue our families these one-time shopping carts, and the value was up to $40. They can use them once to buy shoes, and then Payless would bill our school to pay for the shoes. And we ran that program for five years. And if you qualify for free and reduced lunch, you were able to get one of these cards. If you didn't, you just had to demonstrate need. And the Dean of Students will issue you this shopping card. And we ran that for five years and the numbers of suspensions and detention in that regard went down. But like Principal Cook mentioned, another thing we found out after now reflecting on the uniforms and like digging deep and looking at what's going on, talk about data, we started to notice that Similarly, some of the students were coming to school and that the students who were coming to school had very dirty shirts, very dirty clothing coming in, particularly with a white button up, which was a requirement of the uniform policy. And so um, we were like, we need to address that as well. Like, how do we do that? We weren't as creative as a, a larger mat, uh, which looking back probably would have been a great idea for us. But um, what we decided to do was to go through the board. It actually took us a year to get the board to approve the change in the uniform policy. And we even had to get students involved 
to change the uniform from a blazer and a white button up to a dark colored maroon polo and a gray polo so that it wouldn't you know show up um, and students wouldn't feel embarrassed by their uniform. And so policies like that, like, okay, you have a uniform policy on the surface and it seems good because you're thinking you're addressing the, you know, competition about brands and kids not feeling bad about themselves because they can't wear certain clothes. And so you implement this policy without thinking about all these other layers that play into that and can the families afford it? So we had to have conversations with our vendors like, hey, if you want to partner with us, and this is what you can do at the system level and why I loved working at that level in that way. Because I would tell our vendors, if you want to partner with us, you have to agree to give X amount of free uniforms to families. You have to get certain discounts for our low income students. And we changed vendors several times if they weren't willing to do that. Um, so you have to advocate for your kids and you have to think about policy in that way. Um, that sometimes we don't really do. Um, and then to Charles' point about choice, being in the charter sector, it always behooves me how much debate there were there was about low-income families having the opportunity to have access to a quality education for their child. And that amazed me because my kids went to elite private schools and no one ever had that conversation. Even though those schools took money from the district for transportation every year, special education was even paid for from the district, no one complained about that in our community. No one ever said, they're taking money from our kids. But if we were talking about poor families and the families in the communities that I serve, it became a hot topic of debate. And that just angered me. Like, why is it by virtue of socioeconomic status one family can have access to a quality education while another family cannot? And that to me was a social justice issue. So I went to, um, and I was selected to be a school ambassador fellow at the US Department of Education. And one of the first things, and I think the reason why I probably was selected is because I said that I think we need to revisit the issue of vouchers. And I think families, if I, my, my solution is not to abandon our public schools. I would like for every child, no matter where they are, in a rural setting, urban setting, suburban setting, to have access to a quality education. And we, our kids can't afford to wait while we fix that. So we need temporary solutions. I mean, if you ask me, I think charter schools would probably be the most ineffective solution to addressing the problem because of all the money. But that's what our kids need. Because while we fix the problem, kids can't wait. And so, you know, for me, that would be the other challenge that I have, how much pushback you get. You even mentioned the word vouchers. People are scrambling out the room because they don't want to be seen in that room, in that discussion. Um, and so I just think for me, that was another challenge that I faced of how to bring choice and opportunity to our families who need it the most. <laughs> So the, the question was kind of where we see it, it intersect, and I think it's important to, to recognize that we all have our, our own unique context, and a lot of our experience and our opinions are based around that context. I also want to be cautious to not sell a single story, right? So I'm going to share my experience, what I've seen. It doesn't mean it applies to, to every family or every uh, body who looks like me in, in the country, right? Um, so in, in our community, what we see, uh, and part of what brings me to this work, is to disrupt the school to prison pipeline, because um, we see over 100,000 uh, youth uh, detained and, and, and serve time um, in this country. Out of those, 78% will, will, the recidivism rate is 78%, so they will experience repeat, repetitive uh, incarceration while they're youth. By the time they're 25, 40% of them will, will receive a prison cell and will have a multiple year sentence, right? Uh, we look at the statistics, um, and a lot of those young men of color are falling through the cracks, and it's, it's the cracks that were created by a system that wasn't meant to serve us, right? So I think uh, oftentimes we talk about equality and equity, um, and the, com the conversation becomes a little confused when it talks about fighting over resources. Um, the colorblind approach does not work, right? It would only work if we were at the same starting line, with the same preparation, with the same rest the night before, with the same nutrition. That's not the case. Um, so equity is, is, is what we're really looking for to provide that opportunity for students who are starting far behind. Um, and I think that's... Uh, that's a philosophical um, and mindset shift that needs to happen within the educational sector um, and stop, so that we stop looking at the deficit as something the community and the student brings with them to the institution, but rather the institution has a deficit that isn't serving those communities well. Um, that, those conversations are very difficult. 
we have people running out of the room when that comes up. Um, so my, my mission is to bring that conversation to the table as much as I can um, and to really try and change those systems because uh, again, it was a, a public education system was not designed for today's uh, context or society. I'll bring back my migrant uh, background, um, working in higher ed as well. Sorry, I don't think I mentioned how I've come up through the sector. So I was a high school counselor, then a community college counselor, then a co uh, community college director. Um, and that led me to, to come here and try to get my doctorate. Um, migrant students, the, the, the seasonal farm work doesn't align to the semester system, right? So our students leave uh, to Arizona from California to follow the seasonal crops midway through the fall semester, they return midway through the spring, right? Imagine what that does to, to, to a student's education. Um, but the same is true for higher ed. So if you come from a migrant family, um, or you are a migrant farm worker and you want to change that dynamic for yourself and you want to enter community college, you can't do it because you're never completing a semester. Um, so we also have to be creative about how our uh, institutions are, are set up. Um, it was uh, kind of a, a sad moment for me. I worked at, at a UC Santa Cruz for a little bit. That's where I got my bachelor's degree, um, working with uh, college access programs to help change those statistics. Um, and because of that job, I was able to serve on the admissions side, um, reading uh, personal statements. At one point we had a meeting where we had to make it more difficult to get in because the UC's mission is to accept the top 12% of graduating high school seniors. I'm not saying that was the only reason, but thanks to efforts like the ones we were involved in, that was no longer the case. The UC was capturing 23% of the top graduating seniors, right? So you move the finish line and we start all over again, right? So um, just thinking about the, the systems and how we can uh, and that change in the system to really help uh, increase chances for, for students who haven't had them before. So one of the things when we when we got the news we were going to West Side, uh, it was a uh, it was it was a lot of things going on in school. I was at a, a school where we took the CTE, the Career Technical Education approach. So I, we had construction, we had culinary arts, we had A plus computer repair, and my principal at the time he was at North Carolina College. And North Carolina College uh, gave students college courses during the school year, during their high school career, so they can end up with an associate degree or have some some coursework. So they said, we'll take these two uh, high-performing schools and we'll put it in West Side, where West Side again was the Bermuda Triangle. It was anything went in West Side, nothing came out. So they put us in, and I want to say we had all these great ideas, stuff that was working already, but it was a new a new issue, a new barrier, and it was. One, it was the gangs, so we had to address the gang situation because if you're scared to walk to class, I mean, how could you, you, you learn? Then uh, once we removed the gang situation, it was it's still quality in teachers. We're not getting, and we talked about this earlier, we're not getting those young dynamic guys like you coming out of college wanting to go right into education. I'm getting the failed uh, the, uh, stock market, and now you want to come from Wall Street, and and I'm um, getting these guys like second chance teachers and it's not their love like in order to be in front of babies you have to be passionate and love what you're doing because it's not uh, you're not getting a lot of money from it and we weren't getting those so that now it was trying to re not say recycle but trying to with the tenure laws and all that trying to get some of the best people on the right seats on the bus um, then it became all right let's let's look at the babies now I found out they weren't eating so we so I have siblings that are parentified. I didn't know the word parentified until I got to West Side, and it was these students are taking care of their siblings while the parents are off again doing God knows what. So little Johnny has to walk little Sarah two miles out of his way to her school, then come back to West Side. Now it's ten thirty. Johnny didn't eat. He done missed two classes, and so we had to figure out a way to do that. So we so in, in my state, and Tahita knows like if you don't if you don't uh, live if you live more than if you live less than 2.5 miles away, they won't give you any bus tickets. Mm -hmm. And if I just told you, it was riddled with gangs. So you can live a mile away, but if you have to walk through three gang neighborhoods and cut around, it becomes three miles. So these are the barriers that we were, were coming in contact with and just trying to figure out. So I made the, 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 the breakfast period longer. So we did that and we started trying to get them bus tickets. Um, then it became, all right, my school is, like you said, my school is 100% free and reduced lunch. That means the entire school is impoverished to where everyone gets free lunch. Then we started, we opened up school after school. We did extended day lunch so kids can leave with the meal. So I'm thinking, all right, we won. Everything's taken care of. And you start finding out the kids weren't eating on the weekends. They would go Saturday and Sunday without meals. 
So now it's like, okay, local food bank, let's get some family packs. That's enough food for a family of four. And then you can uh, give that to the family of us eight. We'll give you two packs. And I thought I won again. I'm like, yes, another win. And then uh, trying to call the kids down, it was too embarrassed to come get the, the family packs. So I went to uh, the Gap and Aeropostale, get the little bags for them to put it in and stuff like that, trying to hide it. But again, it was just a Band-Aid on it, the kids. So I started seeing family packs all over the school. And it's like, wow, I'm trying to. And it's so proud. Like, proud is a sin. It's just so these babies know they weren't eating at home but didn't want to be seen with the bag. So um, I'm thinking, what what can I do? So we... Uh, I watch Chopped. I'm a Food Network guy. And, uh, if, if you watch Chopped, they have these mystery baskets. And that's what my family packs were. There'd be some weird stuff in it. It'd be, you have Cheerios, you have some ragu sauce, you have some noodles and oatmeal. And I wouldn't know what you do with that, right? So I said, you know what? I watch Chopped. We're going to create a show, YouTube channel. We're going to do West Side Chopped. And we're going to show these babies how to do these amazing things with these baskets, and hopefully that will empower them to want to take the baskets home and do that. And uh, we did two episodes before we got pulled, right? <laughs> but, um, but the kids are now coming to get the family packs, and now that's been removed. So everything that we the, we all talking about is just finding ways. Like I have some of the most affluent uh, neighborhoods less than a mile away. But I'm in, the, like, I'm sitting on top of a graveyard. Literally, my school is on a graveyard. It's like pet cemetery when you come to my school. It's that bad. But I cannot keep complaining about what's wrong. Like, I have to go undefeated or I'm going to lose a kid. That's like, that's the, I mean, I don't know what more can motivate a person knowing that if I don't win every day, I'm going to lose one of them. So this work is, is tireless, and, you, and, and I applaud everyone that's thinking out, out of the box, but that's what we have to do. This is the new norm for urban education. We have to just do whatever we can because I don't have the parents that are walking to the charter school lines or putting them in private schools. I have a parent that's, oh, you're just going to West Side, and I never see them again. So everything we've been doing at my school has been moving as if we're the parents. So we're making all those decisions. And one of them is uh, just, just breaking down the, the, uh, the notion of uh, graduation rates. Right, they say I had eighty six percent graduation rate last year. They were oh, they clapping and all happy, but if if a hundred or fifty of them are home before Christmas break, what does it matter? Or they got a big bill from Sally Mae, which I know some of you guys know, and now beyond what it's called now, right? <laughs> but um, so it's not just hoarding them off to school to be slaughtered by real life. It's like okay, let's let's break it down into four. This is what I did: four categories. You have you have um, uh, military. You have trade, you have two and four year college, and you have, they're not going to school. You have some student that's not, I cannot cook, I cannot sit here and wait for that long term goal of school while my younger sister and brother are not eating, and I know my mother's not taking care of them. I need a job right now. So I'm hoping that we change the tide and get everyone career ready when they leave. So if they do need to take care of their siblings first, they still know how to take care of them and still go to school or do something like that. But right now, we just cannot keep saying, go to school, go to school, go to school. And I'm a principal, so I'm probably getting in trouble if my, my superintendent hears this. But it's just so, it's just, what are we doing? Like, I mean, literally, and we're not even talking about my, my student with special needs. That's another thing. Like, we're, where are we hoarding them to? So it's like we, we have to come up with other systems to address everything. And I've seen a study that said 50... It said um, 30, million, 30 million jobs are in the U.S. right now that makes $55,000 or more, and it doesn't require a bachelor's degree. Like, why are we not we doing that? So that's some of the work that we've been trying to do at Westside, is trying to get them career ready. So my motto is, uh, from the moment they enter my doors until they gainfully employ and a living wage, we're going to stay with them and try to figure this whole thing out. So that's one of the intersection, what we said, I don't know what I, yes, that's, <laughs> one, that's one of my barriers that we're doing. Um, so as you guys can tell from the amazing kind of comments and experiences of our panelists, and it's no surprise to you, but this is complicated work. There are many intersections um, between the work in education and race and poverty, and thank you for sharing some of the creative ways you guys have um, risen to those challenges. Um, now that we know more about our panelists, their backgrounds, um, kind of the personal perspectives they bring, but also the specific pieces they bring to the work, we would love to hear more from our audience um, and learn more about where you guys want to dig in and the rest of this conversation. Um, so we are going to get back to our poll. Um, just quickly, we saw this in the beginning. We have a diverse group in the room. Um, 
lots of teachers, community-based partners, kind of all across the spectrum. Um, and so we want to know what you guys are most interested in um, in digging in for the conversation. Um, so our next question, and hopefully you're still logged into menti.com, um, is just for you all to tell us what areas are you most interested in exploring um, during this session for the remainder of our time together. So we'll, we'll pause so you guys can take that. So I think what we're going to do is actually turn it to you all. Um, so for those of you, it looks like systems level practices is where a lot of the interest is in the room. Um, so for those 19 who selected that, I would love to ask one of you specifically to kind of talk about why you selected that as an interest and then to pose a question to our panelists. I know there's 19 of you, so <laughs> don't be shy. We'll pass the mics. <laughs> My name is Casey Fees. I'm an EPM student, education policy and management student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, my question is about a system level dilemma, coherence versus autonomy and empowerment. Um, from your perspectives, how do you think about that dilemma? And I think that there's probably some difference, um, judging from the comments we've heard so far. Um, so can you just kind of put us in context and think about, from your experiences, where did coherence lead to greater equity? Or where did autonomy and empowerment lead to greater equity? It's a great question. It's a struggle, right, all the time, right? You have um, people out there that are innovating, that are doing really neat things, but Sometimes it's a bunch of onesies, right? So innovative things that people are doing. And then uh, there are some systems level reforms that are hard to do because you're trying to change the whole system and you're starting back here, right? In what research might call distal variable. And then there's all these other things that take place in between till you get to where you're trying to impact, which is the classroom, which is in research called a proximal variable. And it's hard to do, right? So, um, I think one place that coherence has helped is in trying to measure outcomes in schools better and have data systems where we track how students are doing. It's not perfect, um, but what was done with testing over the last 15 or 20 years has helped give us an idea of what's happening and uh, something to have a discussion around. And it was also, prior to that, there was testing but it wasn't coherent. And the other thing that wasn't happening is nobody was breaking that data out for low-income kids, for black students, for Hispanic students, for students with disabilities, for migrant students. If you looked at what was called disaggregation of data 20 years ago, maybe five states in each of those categories, maybe seven, was breaking out any data whatsoever for those all right. So now we have this new experiment where uh, another federal law was passed called Every Student Succeeds Act, and states have redone this, and we're kind of having a national experiment where states are measuring all different kinds of things now and creating all different algorithms uh, for you know, creating a school index or a grading system. And so we're going to see how, how that goes. Right? We're just going to learn from it. And, uh, I think autonomy has been really important at the building level. I think all the things we're talking about 
are very hard to do if you're in a system where the district decides everything. I don't know how Akbar is pulling off some of the stuff he's doing <laughs> because he's in a traditional public school and he seems they, it seems like they're, they have him on a longer leash maybe than most <laughs> school leaders, right? Which is, is a hill term, right? A, I work for a congressman or senator, but I'm on a long leash, right? I can do a lot of stuff. So uh, I, I think autonomy is, is really important particularly to get some coherence around what everybody brings in terms of school staff to that all time. If we can put people in a building where they're equipped from day one to do what it is that we expect them to do, we can just let them do the work and then like people like me can get out of the business because the reason that politicians and other people parachute in is we don't have that kind of coherence now around what's a professional standard for a teacher, what do we expect every teacher to know from day one when they get to the classroom, and can we ensure they have that? And then we can say, go, once they get there. So Charlie said a couple of things real quick. Um, I think um, coherence around expectations is tremendously important for students. So a lot of the work that I did at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was around something that I'm sure most of you have probably heard about, if you know education work over the past five to 10 years, and that's Common Core State Standards. Um, and very volatile uh, discussion, um, a lot of challenges around it. But right now, across the country, um, at least 40 some states continue to have relatively higher standards than they had before this conversation around Common Core. And I just don't think it's right for certain kids to be expected to know the Pythagorean theorem by eighth grade and other students not actually get introduced to Pythagorean theorem until 12th grade. But that was happening in this country. And the ones who don't get introduced until 12th grade, if they get introduced then, oftentimes look like me, right? Or they have, uh, they have English is not their first language. And so at some point in time, someone needs to step in, have courage, and say, wait a minute, we're going to expect all kids to know this by this time and we're going to do everything that we need to do including giving principals and teachers the autonomy to help them get there but we're not going to change the standard based on who they are we just can't do that especially if we're supposed to be the united states of america and we've done that for so long and that's just when people get into leadership positions who have the power to do something about it do something about it or get out the position. I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to say, Charlie, then called me out. <laughs> In a good way. Yes, sir. You're our closer, man. <laughs> for, for a while, and I just to be funny because we're in Boston, I, I was called like the Ray Donovan of Westside. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I. I have to thank my principal before me. It takes a strong willed man to let this young uh, vice principal spread his wings and do all of these off the wall ideas that I had. So if I didn't have him trying to dull my shine and let me, you know, because I had the pulse of the building, I was with the kids. Um, I don't know what I would do, but I have to speak about my alumni. I have an alumni that's very, very strong and where I don't call on my district to ask me to do these initiatives, my alumni will move it to another fund and we get to do it that way. So it's, it's hard. So one of, the, one of the things I've been trying to do now is trying to figure out how I can do it, show everyone that, 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 that want to know how we're doing these things, how to do it with, in, within Title I or within a regular school budget because what I'm doing with my Lights On program, which I didn't talk about, um, you know, we open from three to six, Monday, Wednesdays, and Friday. I'm, just not, I'm sorry. Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays in the summers from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. And during the school year, we do uh, we do just Fridays from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. where we average 300 kids from all over the city. We feed them, we give them all of these great uh, activities to keep them off the street so they don't get into you know crime. That's one big thing that everyone wants to do, but it's so hard when you don't have uh, support from your district. So what I'm charging myself with is trying to figure out, being a brand new principal, how can I uh, work in my budget or with Title I to provide these resources, but to answer the question about autonomy, it's been my alumni association and just, just having leaders that say, okay, that worked, let's see what he do now, and they just been letting me you know, be on this long leash right now, so <laughs> I, 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 I'm truly trying to figure out how to get the word out, but it's my alumni and, and just, just having those leaders in front of me that are not you know, scared to let me fly. 
I'd love to ask another. Oh, got a volunteer for another systems level question. Um, so I'm in the uh, public health sphere and uh, medical field, and thinking about how education is one of the primarily um, determinants of health. Um, what do you see as um, in ways that we can collaborate between? other sectors. It doesn't necessarily have to be public health, but policy and um, some of the other um, fields and how we can kind of like collaboratively make um, improvements specific to education. I can answer that. Um, one thing that I've been looking at, um, one thing that I've been looking at recently are like community school models. Um, and they've been found to be extremely successful in rural and urban areas. In fact, in Newark, um, Central High School moved to a community school model and they had a really great success doing that. Um, and I think that when we talk about poverty and race and education, and we, and we know all of these challenges that our students bring with them to the classroom, we can't ignore that when they enter our building. So how do we forge those collaborations? And that's one avenue that I've been looking at as a way to do that, um, looking like the um, you know uh, Harlem Children's Zone and um, other initiatives like that, where you provide wraparound services for students with these collaborations with the health sector, with um, eye screening, like just something as basic as kids can't see and they need glasses. So collaborating with the local hospitals and doctors in your area to make sure that that's not a barrier for kids. Um, working with your social workers to find services for food and for um, uh, heating costs even in the winter time. Uh, parents need access to that information and our kids are, can't perform academically if they don't have their social and emotional needs met. Um, so that's one way that I've been looking at as a, a possibility is providing more community schools in rural and urban areas and looking at that as a viable model for addressing some of the challenges that we face in these areas. You had 33% of black and American Indian children under the age of 18 live in poverty, compared to 8% of white students. And black and Latino students make up close to 60% of the student population. And so when we're looking at these statistics, our kids are coming in with these issues, at least 33% of them. So we can't ignore them, but then want to hold them to high standards and expect them to achieve despite these barriers. So that would be one thing that I would mention, and I know at the community college level. Yeah, so um, building off of the community schools, also I think oftentimes we build systems within our school uh, building, and we expect families to come and take advantage of those, and when they don't, mm -hmm. they're the problem. Right? So we need to bring those services to the community where the families really are. Um, so in, in, in Salinas and Castro, we have a lot of family resource centers. I mean, it's like a one-stop hub. So they can access uh, social services, uh, health screenings, vision, dental screenings, uh, laundry machines, and, and uh, washers. Um, so, and, and actually, recently, a, a group of students, of high school students, actually asked that on top of washers and dryers, <laughs> that showers be installed um, for the high percentage of uh, um, homeless people that we have in, in the community um, so they can uh, you know, clean up, and, and it's hard to procure a job uh, if you don't show up presentable, right? If you walk in with that stained shirt, um, smelling of whatever was mentioned earlier. Um, I think the keynote speaker mentioned that, you know, it is illegal to be poor in, in this country. It's illegal to be homeless in this country. You can't loiter, you can't sleep in public places, you can urinate in public places, right? So we need to create um, ways for, for people to actually get ahead. Um, same thing goes for this whole prison pipeline. I mentioned the statistic before, Unless somebody can look at somebody that has that uh, felony on their record and see no problem with it and employ them, we're setting them up for, for cyclical crime, right? It's kind of it, it's something that we need to work on as well. Um, there's been talks about removing the question from job applications, all this systemic stuff that needs to that needs to happen, that needs to take place, so they really stand a chance. Right now, we're working on a project to see if we can provide some career technical education while youth are incarcerated, um, and then when they come out, do a handoff to either a community college or a high school um, that can continue that so that they have a fighting chance of getting a livable wage and, and maintaining employment. So a quick follow-up question um, for our, our panelists kind of building off of that. If you're Raven and you're outside of the education system and you want to help, um, where, how would you advise that she go about either learning about, you know, if there is a community school model in her community or a family resource center, um, and are there other strategies or things that you would want your community partners to be doing? Do you want them to go to the school board meetings? Do you want I leave that open to you, but curious, like what ask would you have for um, partners outside of the system who want to be helpful? I know you got a few minutes. 
I mean, I think you started it here by opening a conversation where you introduced yourself as being for public health in an education setting and trying to start a conversation. Like, that doesn't happen enough, right? Like, colleges and universities are built around all these different departments. So, and the education school is usually pretty isolated from the rest of the college university. There isn't typically a lot of, you know, interdisciplinary work between the School of Education and all the possible um, other entities that could, you know, synergize some of the work. I mean, the model that came to mind when you all were talking was, I used to be a surrogate parent for some kids when I was in grad school in Maryland, and, and, and that just meant that as far as the education and the juvenile justice system was concerned, I was their parent. So um, I went to, what are called, I, how many people know what an IEP is? And so most people. So I, I was the IEP team member for the kid, and that was where a lot of my work was. That's not a bad model to think from. I mean, I'm not, we can have a whole discussion about why, whether or not IEPs really drive, you know, what happens in a classroom. But it is set up to be an interdisciplinary team uh, where everybody's supposed to get together and think of all the needs of a child from all different kinds of perspectives. And, you know, that, that's not a bad spot to start. And I, I, you know, I think in higher ed, just, why should teachers be, just be trained through the Department of Education is what I've started to ask myself. Why can't, why can't it be an interdisciplinary um, program at a college or university where we bring all this from the start and then people come in with that mindset? A great, it's a great question. Um, let me just say one thing I would caution you not to do, and that is um, don't start a new program. <laughs> <laughs> just clarify. Um, Oftentimes we come out of these experiences, these august universities, and we see need and we're like, I'm going to do something about it and I'm going to start something. There are a lot of people doing stuff already. Go join someone else. My name is Maddie, and I work in education administration. Um, so regarding the washers and dryers and showers, those seem like such a straightforward solution. Why are those not everywhere, and how do we make that happen? Wow, I don't, I mean, I don't know, I, for, when I first was thinking of it with, with the team, there's a there's a wash and dryer in every high school in America. That's not not a question. They're just not letting the students use them. They usually use for the sports teams. You know, one manager going there. And I just ask the question: If we have this many students that are homeless, like Eric said, or this many babies coming in without, why are we not letting them use it? So it's about talk about systems. It's setting up systems. So right now, so so way we have it at Westside. And I and I was scared when we first did the wash and dries. I thought it was going to take the most bravest students to be. The ones, because remember that with the food, they didn't take the food, right? I have phones, and I'm gonna get back to the story. Sprint was gonna give every high schooler a phone, free phone. If you was a freshman, you had a free phone for four years. Sophomores, three years, right? It wasn't an iPhone, so they didn't want it. I mean, kids with no phones with a cracked phone, you know how to get some of your phones probably cracked right now, right? <laughs> so they wouldn't take it. It was like that pride, oh, I don't want the, the free stuff. Or Audible came and gave us that, I don't want the free stuff. So how would I get those kids that are prideful to a, to a fault to, to come wash? So I want to say that first week it was like, oh my God, I hope I done started this thing and it's going to blow up in my face. But it took some athletes to come in at first. It was the athletes. And once the athletes, they usually you know run the building for us, the cool kids, they started doing it. Then I have a lot of immigrant students, first year, uh, first generation students from uh, a lot from West Africa, Nigerians and uh, from Ghana. And they could kill us with anyone saying they're gonna take care of their family, <laughs> right? So, so they was coming in. So I initially thought that we would, you know, would open up maybe seven o'clock in the morning, seven thirty in the morning, and let the kids just leave their stuff in a little locker and come get it. 
When I say the washing dryers are being used every day, all day, we stay open to about 7 o'clock at night, every day, 11 o'clock on Fridays and Saturdays, we have detention, so I open it up as well. It, it is being used every day, all day, and those kids could care less what anyone thinks. It's like, it's like I grew up from the time when it says closed mouths don't get fed, so I'm happy that we're creating that culture because now we started asking the donations just not be laundry detergent. Let's give me those feminine products for my baby girls. Let's give me the deodorant, the soap, the body wash, and all that stuff. So now we have free a free store where the kids can come cook. Uh, it's like five people with keys open up a school store. They go in and take whatever they need out and go. And I'm so happy that that culture is happening now. But it was a scary moment. And, and, and I think every school is going to have to go through your rite of passage. If your local school opens it up, it's going to be some, oh, you use a laundromat. You have to, you know, almost not... I don't know how you do it. It's going to be, I don't know how the culture you're building is. You have to figure out a way to help those babies that needed to navigate through those uh, folks that are going to be more, you know, hurtful or harmful in that way. But um, I'm hoping it's catching on. Like I've seen the Washington Redskins just bought a whole thing for uh, like students in the area. So it's, it's contagious now. Love is contagious. And I'm hoping that uh, more schools can do it. Cause I, but, but, but I will say this. I thought it was just going to Lowe's. Or, or Home Depot and buying five wash and dryers. That's not the case. Like when you're dealing with school and we talked about autonomy, when I first, um, uh, you know, they said uh, I wanted to wash and dryers, they went downtown and downtown came back. Oh, we got to send the architects out. I just wanted to turn the classroom into a laundromat. Just five washes, five dryers, bend it out, that was it. I thought, you know, like we could have, like we could have did that, right? When I, when I say the architects came back and said it was $300,000 for, for this. And I'm like, I wanted a laundry room, not a laundry house. Like, what are we talking about? Like, so that, that's what took a long time. It's, it's going through all of the, the jargon from down to, I call it, it's two-seater street, you know. My board of ed, just all this, it just all the workers, the, uh, all the union, the, the workers went overtime. And it's like we're talking about babies. So it's going to be that problem, too, where you're going to have to go through all of the, the, the union stuff and, it's going to be a fight, but if you really got the best interest of kids and you do it, I, how could you go wrong? So I'm hoping more folks it catches on. All right, so we have time for one more question, um, and you have an option. One, you can just ask, you know, a burning question you have on your mind. Um, but we also wanted to ask you all, um, as sort of diverse members of the Harvard community, what could this panel of people who come from such a diverse range of backgrounds, from research, academia, philanthropy, practitioners, what could we collectively be doing more of or differently to support your work on the ground um, in reducing poverty and inequities? So you've got an option to either give feedback to that question, which I would love to hear, or you can ask another question that is burning on your mind. I'm good. <laughs> How you doing? My name is Nick Johnson. Um, touching on the whole school to pipeline situation, sort of breaking generational poverty. Um, so I, I went to school in Philadelphia, like high school for trash, the same schools that failed, like my parents failed me. Um, and there was like this stigma in the school a lot of times. Sort of touching on what Mr. Cook mentioned, where it was um, the few that were talking about going to college were the ones who were sort of focused on. Everyone else was sort of left to the wayside, and so there were a bunch of people who weren't taught any other skill, no financial literacy, nothing about real estate, electricity, like anything, some type of trade. Um, and so they got lost in informal economy because no one was teaching them about like a formal one by the time they graduated. So like, how do we approach having like some of these um, skill classes or just like other forms of like education implemented into like general education? This is actually something that I've been grappling with since I've been at Hugsy. Um, as I mentioned, coming from my background, education, higher education, was that's the only lever to accomplish that. So I was a part of the College for All movement for many, many, many years. I'm starting to now realize, especially those statistics that, that you quoted earlier, um, it does, it's not necessary to break the, the generational poverty, right? There are other avenues. I think the problem that I saw is that we were tracked that way. Um, so for, for, for me, my personal experience, my regular high school counselor, put me in weight training four years while I was in high school in small engine repair. All four, I can't say the weight training part, but. So um, it wasn't until my migraine counselor that started talking to me about college that they became a thing. So for me, it's about options. It's not college for all, it's options for all. And having our students be able to make an informed decision of what path they want to 
they really want to go down, um, and really understanding themselves a little bit better. So coming from the counseling background, I also think the public education system does not use counselors to the best potential. Um, we are there, uh, in many schools they do discipline, and in my high school they were uh, our counselors and they were our disciplinary. So when I was getting suspended, I was interfacing with my counselor. When else did I want to see my counselor? Never, <laughs> right? So it was an adversarial relationship that was created. Um, but really leveraging everything we have in the schools so that students can explore options and can realize that. The other thing that happened when I was a college counselor is that most of the young ladies and young uh, men wanted, aspired to hold the job that they had encountered in the day-to-day -day life. So even opening their minds to those things that they haven't seen yet, and which is why it's important that people that look like us are here because we're gonna be that person that they encounter and they might aspire to what we do. Um, so I don't know if that answers the, the, the question completely, but that's kind of, I'm moving towards the more options for all. Um, and we didn't touch on it a lot here. Uh, I think it, it was alluded to a little bit um, when the cohesion and the empowerment and the autonomy question came up. I love the concept of autonomy and empowerment if there's a standard of uh, efficacy amongst all educators. And I think that's part of the problem right now is that as, as a field, um, it's true, even the fact that it has a union that's more, more aligned to like an electrician union than it is to like what doctors experience, right, or engineers experience, tells us as a society how, what value we're placing on the teaching profession. Um, and the teaching profession has just as dire implications of life and death, as we know, uh, than being a doctor. So I think that's part of the problem as well. Um, I can't um, go too many places without reciting poetry because um, <laughs> I love poetry. Um, and I used to teach it for years. It's still in my heart. Langston Hughes said, bring me your dreams, you dreamers. Bring me your heart melodies that I may wrap them up in a blue cloud cloth away from the two rough fingers of the world. And that is what poetry might do. Wrap it your dreams, protect, preserve, and hold them until maybe they come true. Columbus dreamed of finding a new world, he found it. Edison dreamed of light, more light, he made light. All the progress that human beings had made in this old earth of ours grew out of dreams. That is why it is wise, I should think, to hold fast to dreams. For when dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. And in so many ways, what we do, what I do, speak for myself as an educator, is try to position systems, structures, processes, people in a way that ensures the people who have dreams realize their dreams, especially those who are often in a position of marginalization. I should have never said I should go after you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. I mean, I wish I could quote from it, but um, Joni Mitchell has a great song called Black Crow. And you know what, clothes, and, and, and so I'm old, but a guy named Jaco Pastorius <coughs> plays bass on it. If you've ever heard Jaco Pastorius play bass, he was one of the best that I ever heard. So, trust me. Um, two tips there, but the point is, and this goes to what you were saying about, you know, don't start a new organization, try to avoid the shiny thing that the black crow always swoops down on, because the black crow, once they get that shiny thing, they're on to the next shiny thing, they just drop it somewhere, and so I think in today's society, there's a lot of gravitation to shiny things, and, um, for those of us sometimes who are out there trying to do the work, we wonder where all the energy that's going to social media and starting new organizations. And like conferences are great, but there's a, you know, some people are just professional conference attenders. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, you know? Like, it's, it's a good life to be able to do that, but we need people out there doing the work. And the good part is doing the work is actually very fulfilling. 
Uh, first, I want to thank you guys for having me. This is like, I was home when Vegeta hit me on LinkedIn. And all I heard was Harvard, and I said, I'm in. <laughs> Come on. This kid from North New Jersey is talking at Harvard, right? So, but uh, just just being mentors, I think if you, if you guys have an experience of mentor in your life, um, hats off to you, but in order to go further, you're going to need one. Um, we talked about oh, how can you help. Just come to the schools. Just come. Like Everybody do a lot of talking, and this is why I get in trouble. Come to, come to the school. I told you what, that the hours I was open.